My life's been a strange life from abuse, death, drug addiction, crime, to becoming a bishop. So it don't get much stranger, really. So I was brought up in uh, a loving family, really. And uh, when I got to about the age of 11, my life completely changed. I went out to school one day, just kind of like this happy-go-lucky kid. Bit of a mummy's boy, really. And uh, on my way to school, I was attacked. And uh, I, I, I still sometimes get them little flashbacks and it's, it's a taste in my mouth of like a, a woolly jumper coming across my mouth and not being able to breathe. And, uh, you know, sadly I was raped. And I didn't sort of understand what was happening. Understood the pain, uh, the fear. And the man that did it sort of, I was on the floor after and he picked me up, picked me up off the floor by my throat. And, uh, and he said that if I told anybody, he'd kill my mum and dad. And if you can imagine, I was 11, but more like all those years ago, I'm more like a seven year old is now. So I was a real child, you know, kind of a real kid really. And it petrified me and something happened to me physically uh, and spiritually as well. So it was like, uh, describe it as having my head in a bucket of water so I could hear the noise all around me but I wasn't there it, the, it was distant and my eyesight was black and white it was like the color had been drained out of what I could see I think a significant thing in my mind is when I went home uh, that evening because I went to school and went through the day I don't think I even spoke. I didn't speak all day. You know, it's quite a strange thing I, when I think by it. I never said one word all day and nobody noticed. It says something about people, doesn't it? And human beings, really. When I went home that night, I can remember a night that were like uh, shadows shining in onto the wall and I kept seeing these faces and the fear was just consuming me. I was desperate to burst out crying because I hadn't cried. And uh, I thought if I cry and my mum and dad hear me, they're going to come in and, and this man might come and kill them. So I was petrified to cry. And I could feel this, it's almost like a heartbeat but in my stomach like an anxious feeling and uh, I bit the covers. I just bit them and then I was able to cry and I cried and I cried and I cried, cried for hours, but nobody heard. And uh, what I didn't realize then at that point was that I'd never cry again, you know, for 30 years, 30 years, something like, yeah, about 30 years. Uh, I did pluck up the courage to I thought, I'm going to tell my dad. And uh, I walked downstairs and we had a long corridor, like an old Victorian ter terraced house. And it was a Saturday morning and my dad was coming through the front door and I walked down the stairs and as he walked in, and I, I really was going to tell him, you know, what had happened. And he said, come in, son, sit down. Your sister's dead. And he went into the kitchen and I heard a sound and I've heard it many times since in, in the work that I do now, and it haunts me. It's like the sound of pain and love mixed together. For me, it's the sound of Jesus on a cross. And it's the sound of Mother Mains when she loses a child. It comes from deep down inside and it wails out. And he filled the house and bounced off every wall and hit me. And I knew at that moment that I could never speak about what had happened to me. And I went upstairs and my mum had, uh, she had some painkillers because she had a bad back. 
and I took a handful of these painkillers and I don't even know why because I knew nothing about drugs. I think I just thought when mum's not well, she takes tablets and she feels better. So I did, I took a handful of painkillers and I laid on the bed and this little boy just went to heaven. I just floated out my own body. There was no pain. I felt so comfortable and relaxed. It was like uh, somebody was wrapping like a quilt around me and loving me. And then sadly, as the painkillers wore off, I came back down to earth with a re real big bang. It was like I hit the bed and it was just like, it's real. What's happens real? So I spent, I don't know, probably 30 years, you know, just constantly trying to float away from reality out of my body. And the more I did it, you know, the harder it became when I came back down to earth. Probably by the time I was 14, 15, I was earning more money than my dad uh, from criminal activity because I used to like to plan things and and do things, it, it became like a game, you know? It was like, you know, the games I should have been playing as a child, really. I made into sort of like uh, how I could get money and I started to play these games. Uh, and I found I was good at it. The drugs led me into a sort of like a, an underground dark world. And uh, I had a gun. And then the first time I had a gun in my hand, I remember holding it and touching it and feeling it. And it was like, uh, I felt power like I never felt before. It, it was like, whether it were loaded or not, I'd touch it and stroke it and hold it. And, and it was like, I felt so much comfort. And when I put it down, I felt like there was something missing. So I liked to have it with me. And if I couldn't have the gun, then I liked to hold a knife and, and touch it and feel the handle. and touched the blade and that and, and it, I got this sort of like almost sick fascination with guns and knives it was like uh, I felt safe when I had them you know I think you know as I look back it was no one's ever going to hurt me again I've been arrested for murder twice uh, I've been arrested for armed robbery several times been arrested for firearms offences on stupid amounts of occasions when people owed money to other people uh, I would go sometimes with others and sometimes on my own and uh, administer the punishment there was a time where I just left the house a young lady's house and five minutes later the house got hit and these people would have killed me and they, they would have made a real mess of me as well it wouldn't have been a nice end they'd have cut bits of my body parts off. And uh, five minutes. So again, you've escaped, you've gone. And it's like a, a bravado. I was sat in a car once at say, traffic lights and somebody pulled up beside of me and tried to shoot me. Well, they did shoot me, they shot me three times, but they missed. And that wasn't scary. That was, just part of what was happening at the time and and it just created more adrenaline in me because i didn't have those emotions and those fears it, it's 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 bizarre when i look back now because you know i'd be led on floor you know captain i'm sure but not then because life was different then you know by this time i was a young father with three children and uh, my wife had a breakdown a mental breakdown. Uh, I'm not surprised. You know, the police had come round and raided their house looking for guns and stolen items and all sorts over and over and over and over again. I had no respect for authority, you know. Sadly, my wife is still seriously mentally ill now, even 25 years later, 20 odd years later. And when I discovered cocaine, that was, again, it was like a stimulant and this confidence and this bravado just went through the roof. Uh, and then a few years later, I learned how to rock it up, which means 
I had crack then, which was far more potent. It's cocaine, but it's far more potent. And that was it. Uh, my mental health, uh, my relationships, everything. So I began to suffer. So I'd travel around, you know, people would call me and uh, people would come to me and I'd, I'd travel around and spend a lot of time in Manchester, Liverpool, Glasgow and sometimes Leeds and people would pay me to do uh, criminal acts and I would willingly and then I could come back home and pretend to be a normal dad and I could sustain it. I sustained it for years until... One day, the crack sort of had such an adverse effect on me that I started to become more and more psychotic. So I became more and more dangerous and I started to do erratic things. It was on one of these outings, shall we say, that uh, I'd gone to uh, collect a debt, really. And uh, I was in a car on my own, a bottle of vodka, which I always had, just down the side of the, in the pocket of the side of the car crack in my pocket and a crack pipe and uh, a gun in a plastic bag. I always had a knife on me anyway. And uh, I was waiting outside the gym for the guy to come out. And uh, he did. He walked out of the gym and I jumped out of the car with my gun wrapped in the carrier bag. And as I had it by my side and just turned to walk towards him, I looked and there were two little girls behind him and he just grabbed the hands, got hold of both hands and turned and walked. And I was just stood off to the side. Oh, and do you know, I really, really wish I could say, oh, the, 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 the little girls were there so I didn't do anything and because I wasn't that bad, but that's not true. So the truth is that I didn't care the kids were there. I wouldn't have hurt the children, but I wouldn't have cared that they were there. I'd have just thrown them out of the way or something. And light shone off the hands. And I didn't have a clue what was happening. And it hit me in the face. And I couldn't see, but only for 10, maybe 15 seconds. And then I started to shake, started to feel sick. I was sweating. And I felt something rip inside my stomach. And then blood started coming out of my mouth and it was all over me. I looked like I'd been stabbed up. I staggered back to the car and they just walked past. And I grabbed the vodka and I drank it. And if anybody understands addiction, you know, like you have a drink and you smash it. If you're an addict, you don't sip it usually, but I didn't. I smashed it because I wanted that. Ah, and it didn't give me that ah feeling. And it didn't burn. You'd at least get a feeling from it. It went down and it just didn't burn, it didn't do anything. So I put it back down the side and just smoked a little bit of crack and it didn't do anything. So when everything that you know to take your feelings away and to change your feelings doesn't work, what do you do? So I just drove away and I just pulled into a little industrial park, pulled over to the side and I said a type of a prayer, but it's not really, it wasn't really a prayer. It was like, I didn't really believe in God, but I just thought, I said it out loud as well. You know, God, if you're real, you better help me. So, you know, kind of pretty demanded that God do something, you know, which it makes me smile now because I think it's quite arrogant that, isn't it? You know, God, you better do what I want you to do. And I got the answer straight away. Nothing, nothing at all. Just deadly silence. And you know, I'd had enough was so desperate inside. I can't tell you how painful it was inside me. All these years, pain just swirling, the drugs not working, the alcohol not working for the first time. And in a second, I just put it under my chin and I just pulled the trigger. And uh, it didn't go off and I knew guns, I knew I knew it was an automatic weapon and I knew that if it clicks, you'd, I'd die. Because there's bullets in it, it can't not go off. And it didn't go off. 
and I just dropped it on the floor and uh, the water just stopped pouring out my eyes. It was, uh, I wasn't sobbing, but I hadn't cried for perhaps 30 years, you know, and I didn't know what it was. I didn't know the emotions or the feelings, but it was like my eyes were being washed. That's all I can describe it as. And then after five, ten minutes, the 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 water running out of my eyes turned to sobs. And you know, I cried and I cried and I cried and I uh, I felt like I was crying for the little boy, you know. I didn't feel like I was crying for me. I felt like I was crying for that little boy that couldn't tell anybody and no one had seen him. I felt I was crying because nobody loved him. I, uh, I left, got rid of the car and... Uh, you know, before I put the gun away, I uh, fired it into the ground several times and it fired every time. So I took away with me this uh, different thing inside me and I didn't understand what it was. I didn't understand what was happening to me. I was arrested, uh, I think, within a day on a, a different charge, or a minor charge. And when they questioned me at the police station, it became quite apparent that uh, I was, you know, mentally ill and I'd become quite dangerous, not just to myself, but potential danger to other people. And I got a uh, section on the Mental Health Act. So I had a policeman on one side, a policeman on the other, and they took me into a psychiatric unit and, uh, it was like a, a law, you know, like an old time law, this big tough guy that's had all this money and done all these bad things, this gangster, whatever you want to call it. Walking into a psychiatric unit, battered and beaten and not even knowing who he is. And do you know what's sad? It, it felt like an 11 year old boy was walking into a psychiatric unit. And it was almost like I needed a grown up to hold my hand. But whilst I was in there, something so bizarre happened to me. I sat down. I, people gave me cigarettes that didn't even know me. These were the patients. Somebody gave me a pair of training shoes and Somebody else gave me a track suit. For why are they giving me stuff? What? They don't even know me. And I think as I look by, they didn't know me, but they knew my pain. And I was sat round the table drinking coffee and with two guys and one was a schizophrenic, one was an alcoholic. They'd had a breakdown. And they both told me that they'd been sexually abused. Never heard anybody ever say that out loud. And you know, for the first time, I just said, you know, that happened to me. But not as bad as you. It only happened to me once. And the guy said, he went mad at me. He went, mate, once is too much. It's the same. Never ever say only apple lobs. I came out and I ended up in a homeless hostel, which really gave my pride a massive hammering. I had like a, an angelic experience whilst I was in then. I tried to process whether that was my mental health or whether it was a God. And uh, years and years later, now, I believe, I believe it was God and maybe God worked in my illness, but I'd never seen anything that wasn't there before, you know, but I did at this point and it was an angel and the angel was speaking to me and saying things and 
uh, and I did what this angel said and, and it's led me out of addiction. Uh, and I understand people might listen and say, you know, you were nuts. And yes, I was, you know, and I was getting well. But it, it did work for me. You know, it did, some, it did something for me. I was sat in a McDonald's restaurant and I was like, I don't know, probably 17, 17 and a half stone of muscle. I looked scary then. But I was all right, you know, I was, I was quieter. I was a little bit more humble than I had been, you know, and there was no drugs involved, you know, or drink. And uh, I looked across the room and I saw an alcoholic and uh, whisperware and I bought him a coffee and I bought him something to eat. And uh, I arranged to meet him the next day and uh, talked to him and tried to help him and he did. He turned up the next day and, and I went in, in, in the same place and uh, I helped him, you know, and he died two years later, but he died with a type of faith and a type of understanding of something bigger than him really. And uh, he died sober and he got his family in his life, I guess. And uh, I never told him. He was the man that raped me. And uh, the truth of what happened was the second time I met him was to kill him, wasn't to help him. I, uh, I had a knife on my sleeve and I had one in my sock because if somebody took the knife off me whilst they were killing him, I'd take the one out of my sock and finish him off. I'd spend 30 years slavering over if I ever saw him again. All my pain, all my fears, all my anxieties were from this man. And he had to die. It's like uh, the power to do it, it was so strong, you know, and I wasn't going to do it to get away with it. I was going to do it in front of everybody and almost like as a piece of work. Look what happens to people who do that. And I walked into the restaurant and dropped the knife. So I just had all of the blade in my hand and he smiled at me. And it was that, when he smiled at me, this anger inside me just got huge. And I heard a voice, not a schizophrenic type voice, it was in my head, in my thinking, and it was inside. And he just said, mate, why are you living in his sin? And he just stopped me in my tracks, put the knife back up my sleeve, why are you living in his sin? And he wouldn't go away and he just kept coming back and coming back into my thoughts, into my thoughts. So I went and bought two coffees and sat down, shaking inside. And he's just talking and and I'm thinking, you need, you're you getting it. You, you've got, to, I couldn't understand what was happening to me. And I got this moment of absolute clarity and it was, Forgiveness is never saying it's all right what you've done to me there, there, there. Because I thought that's what it were, and it, that's impossible for me. There, 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 it's all right, it doesn't matter. Because it does matter. It destroyed my life. But forgiveness was saying, I'm not going to live in his sin. Because if I live in his sin, I kill him, I go to jail, hurt on the people, my family, da 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 and the, and the sin goes on and on and on and on and on and on. Or I choose not to live in it. And it was just so simple for me at that moment. It was, I did feel forgiven, you know, for the things I'd done. Life changed. My life definitely changed from that point on. I, uh, 
I found this sort of type of faith that uh, I sort of uh, were drawn towards. And uh, I went to university and to study theology in Manchester. And uh, it was very strange because I didn't have much of an education. And uh, to be really bad, you had to get 40% in your first year. That's to be bad. I got 17. Uh, so it was not just really bad, it was very, very, very bad. And uh, they said, you can't read and write properly, mate, can you? And I went, no. So well, why are you trying to do a degree? So I thought God had helped me. And they just sort of smiled and I got tested. Uh, they paid and, and got me tested and I find out was dyslexic and dyspraxic and I had something called Herlin syndrome. And I got these glasses, not these ones, but similar. And uh, my world changed, changed. Honestly, it was like I could read and I could understand and I could process things and I got an education. So I retook the year and uh, I went on and did a degree and I got a good degree as well. And uh, it opened more doors for me. I met some amazing people and uh, I ended up getting ordained, you know, ordained as a minister. So we set the church up and the work that we do with uh, addiction and mental health and homelessness and everything else. I got, I got a phone call and it was from Kensington Palace. This is a few years ago and I, and I was like, I honestly, I'm so stupid sometimes. I thought it was a football team. Honestly, I thought it was like Crystal Palace. I didn't, you know, I've never been to London. I haven't been anywhere then. And uh, when I Googled it after the phone call, it was thought, oh, blimey, this is like royal thing. And uh, they arranged a Zoom meeting. And on this Zoom meeting was uh, the staff and, and everybody else of the royal family. It was like, oh, my word. And it was coming out of the pandemic. And it, were, and it was like... Uh, it was their first uh, engagement uh, after the pandemic uh, in person, kind of in person. A little boy, he was, he was 10 at the time, and uh, he uh, was in pieces. His mum's gone. And uh, he said, you know, he said, uh, I uh, swung my mum back. Pastor Mick, I just won my mum back. And uh, when I met Prince William, I got him to come with his grandma. So he got to meet him. And uh, there was a beautiful moment there. So the Prince William said to the to the child, so how do you know me? How do you know Pastor Mick? And he said, uh, he did my mum's funeral for free. And... Prince William said, listen, I know what it feels like. And I lost my mum. And he's talking about, obviously, Princess Diana. And I watched a moment that for this young kid, his life in that moment, something happened and it was changed. Nobody who'd lost the mother had ever spoke to him. And something happened there between them. And uh, for both of them, I think, and I watched it, it was real, and they shared something, and Prince William said to him, don't worry about what anybody says about her, you know you loved her, no matter what, and you must remember that. <laughs>